Hi everybody. Um, we're gonna keep reading *A Night Divided* by Jennifer A. Nielsen. Um, we're on chapter twenty-one. Our progress over the next few days was dreadfully slow. The large clumps of dirt turned into even larger rocks that seemed as impassable as the Berlin Wall itself. Fritz and I spent hours chipping at the edges to pull the, the rock out, but too often that just led to finding other rocks in our way. Fritz stood back and examined the dirt wall. If this is how the rest of tunneling will be, we might as well give up. Let's turn sideways and go around it. I brushed my sweaty hair out of my face. It can't all be rock under here. What if it is? It could take months. Then let it take months, I said. At least we're still moving forward. I don't have months, Fritz said. It's just weeks until they'll expect me for military duty. I was ready to keep arguing, but he only picked up the shovel again. So there's really no time for complaining, huh? He was the one who'd complained, not me. And besides, I was still feeling the surge of energy from our brief argument. I used it to pry my fingers into the dirt and yank out one of the larger rocks. Dirt tumbled over my shoulders when it fell, but I only smiled. I felt better now. I should make you angry more often, he teased. Help me carry this rock up. Then I've got some work to do above. Earlier that morning, Fritz had removed the hinges from a closet door in our apartment. When I, While I screw these on the wood boards over the window, maybe you can use the rocks to build us a stairway, he said. That way it's not such a climb for you to get out. I did as he suggested, but spent most of that time thinking about how lucky I was to have Fritz there. He was, a resor he was resourceful and good with his hands. So good, in fact, that I sometimes felt like a useless child getting in his way. Sure, I helped him dig and carried buckets of dirt into the basement, and every night I was just as tired as he was when we stumbled back into the apartment. But I had also begun to appreciate how hard this tunnel project was, how much bigger than what I had first imagined. On one of those walks home, we were stopped on the street by Frau Eberhardt, who patrolled the front of our apartment building better than most of the guards in the watchtowers. She saw the dirt on our hands and faces and waddled over to us. I looked up at Fritz. Remember, Frau Eberhardt thinks we've been gardening. Gardening what? He asked. I didn't answer because Frau Eberhardt was upon us then, and he could only smile politely at her. What a pleasure to see the two low children. If she felt any pleasure, it was in watching us squirm. I can tell you've been busy. Her eyes flicked from me up to Fritz. I wasn't sure which of us was dirtier. We hadn't taken the time to wash off in the pond before leaving tonight. Fritz worried if we did that too often, it would stand out to the guards. Maybe that was a mistake, though. Because sure as anything, we stood out now. We might as well have pasted signs on our chests announcing our plans. <coughs> we have been busy, I said a bit too defensively. And we're late for supper, so if you'll excuse us. Late for whose supper? Frau Eberhardt asked. Your mother isn't there to prepare it. Where has she been? I miss visiting with her. She didn't miss visiting with Mama because my mother avoided her like she'd dodge a black cat sitting on a crack on the sidewalk. And this woman was far unluckier than any old wives' tale. Our mother is helping our grandmother recover from an injury, Fritz said. We expect her back very soon. Maybe tonight, I offered, which it was why, which is why it would be rude to be late. Even as the words fell from my mouth, I could have kicked myself for saying them. Why use such a stupid lie to remind her that I had already tried to lie before? Fritz covered for me. Goethe means that we are hungry and need to get some supper. 
We wish our mother was home to share it with us, but if she isn't, we expect her soon. Let's hope so. Frau Eberhardt pursed her lips and began examining us again. It's not wise to allow young people too much time on their own. Children will get into trouble. I'm not a child anymore, Fritz said. By the end of this month, I'll join the military. And how will you fill your time until then? I heard you're not working as a bricklayer anymore. Gardening, I said. That garden I told you about. We've been working on it. Where is it? Frau Eberhardt asked. I used to love to garden, and I would love to come by and give you some advice. We'll take you there sometime. I took Fritz's arm and started to walk forward with him. Thanks for your help, Frau Eberhardt. We'd better go. Once we were inside, Fritz stared down at me and shook his head. Even before he spoke, I understood his concern. Frau Eberhardt wouldn't go away, and she would expect to see evidence of a garden. We haven't pulled a single weed, Fritz said, nor do we have permission to garden there, or any tools or seeds to get started. This is a big problem, Goethe. I agreed completely, but after another long day of digging and pulling out rocks, my brain felt as rubbery as my arms and legs. We were running out of food in the apartment, but that was okay too. As tired as I was, I didn't feel all that hungry anyway. I barely took enough time to wash off before I fell into my bed, already asleep as my head hit the pillow. Chapter 22 I slept late the next morning, and when I awoke to bright sunshine, I darted from my bed. Why was it so quiet in here? Had Fritz overslept too? He wasn't in his room, and when I called his name, there was no answer. Now, in a panic, I ran into the front room. He was definitely gone, and his shoes were missing from beside the door. My first, that, my first thought was that he had gone over to the welcome building on his own, but I hoped that wasn't the case. We had agreed that it was always safer for the two of us to go there together. Still... I went on a hunt for my shoes, wherever I had pulled them off in the fog of last night. While looking for them, I spotted a note on the kitchen table from Fritz. It only said, Be back soon. Stay here. There was no word about where he had gone, or why, or how long he would be gone other than soon, which was useless. Was it something dangerous? Was that why he chose to go alone, to keep me safe? Because if so, then how could I be sure he would be back soon, or even that he would come back at all? With my heart threatening to pound out of my chest, I began pacing the floor. He'd said nothing last night about any errands. Claudia had broken off their relationship, so he wasn't sneaking out to spend time with her. Or at least I thought their relationship was over. If she wanted him back, I knew he'd agree to it in an instant. He talked about her all the time while we were digging. But our conversations about her always ended with him knowing they could never be together. Claudia was fiercely loyal to her father, and her father was no less loyal to the GDR. He wouldn't trust Fritz within a kilometer of her. Finally, I gave up pacing. Not because my anxiety was any better, but because I suspected whoever was on the other end of the hidden microphones might somehow figure out I was pacing and wonder why. We had dishes in the kitchen sink that hadn't been done in days. I washed those up and then swept the floor of all the dirt we had tracked in. Slowly, I became absorbed in that work, because even if I didn't know what was happening with Fritz, at least I was doing something. I went to make my bed, but realized the sheets were filthy from the dirt that came in on my hair and clothes at night. It didn't seem right to make up an unclean bed, but I didn't feel like washing the sheets and hanging them to dry either. A quick glance at Fritz's bed, a quick glance at Fritz's bed showed his was even worse than mine, and I left them both unmade. It was only then, as I slowed down, that I realized how hungry I was. I'd missed supper last night, and the sandwiches I made for Fritz and me at lunch got thinner every day. 
Fritz hadn't told me how much Mama sent in her last letter, but he felt like we ought to save whatever was left for tunneling supplies rather than groceries. The more I went through our empty cupboards, the more I disagreed. We needed food. Mama kept a cookie jar on top of the refrigerator. I never went into it because as far as I could tell, it never it had never held cookies or sweets of any kind. But our food supplies were getting low. If she had stashed anything in there, I wanted it. I opened the cookie jar and immediately all my hopes deflated. It was empty. Of food, anyway. An old envelope was at the bottom, though, and I pulled it out, then caught my breath in my throat. It was a letter from Papa. The stamp dated it to September 1961, about the time the wall replaced the barbed wire fence. I pulled out his letter, which began, To my dear family. But every line after that was blacked out with a thick black marker. Every single line. No wonder Papa never wrote to us. There was no point in it. The envelope was addressed with our apartment number, and the return address came from West Berlin. If the return address was current, then that was where Papa lived now. And maybe his letters were blacked out, but if I wrote to him, would my words be blacked out too? I couldn't see anything wrong with a daughter writing to her father in the West. No matter who the father was, and no matter what the daughter really wanted, it should be okay. Well, that last part wasn't true. I had to be careful. The letter I wrote to my father was simple. I said nothing more than what absolutely had to be written and weighed each word carefully, just in case the Stasi intercepted it. Papa, I hope all is well with you. We are all fine, though Mama is out of the city to take care of Oma Gertrude's broken leg. Could you please send some money to help us plant a garden? Fritz is looking for work, and we need a little extra. Love, Goethe. I debated whether to mention anything about the tunnel, but couldn't figure out a way to word it so that it wouldn't tip off the Stasi. There were so many questions I wanted to ask, none of them more important than whether Fritz and I were doing what he wanted by digging that tunnel. But I wasn't foolish enough to write a question like that. Before I could talk myself out of sending the letter, I put a stamp on it and then ran down to the street to drop it in the post office box. That's where I was when Fritz came running up to me with a paper in one hand and a bag in the other. What are you doing out here? He asked. Nothing? I frowned at him. Where were you? I've been worried. Fritz pulled me near the wall of our building and showed me the paper. They're called Schriebergarten. Allotted space for interested families. The state gives permission to garden in certain areas, legally. I went to ask if we might use that small piece of land near the Welcome Building to make a garden. This paper is our permit. And in this bag I even have some small gardening tools and corn seeds. They just gave them to us? The condition is that we don't own the land and we certainly can't live on it. And technically, they'll own everything we grow, though they said we could share in the harvest. They don't mind that it's so near the wall? A lot of farmland comes up to the wall, so they're used to it. Fritz's smile was so wide it nearly spread off his face. Don't you see? We have a reason to be there now. Even their permission. We don't have to sneak on and off the property anymore. My brow furrowed. The Stasi keep the file. Oh, my brow furrowed. We have files, Fritz. Why would they give us permission? Fritz shrugged. The Stasi keep the files. Maybe the agriculture office doesn't know about them. He showed me the paper again. This is good news, Goethe. This could save us. I couldn't share in his relief or excitement. This only changed one big problem into a different sort of worry. Yes, but now we'll have to build a garden instead of digging. When are we going to do that? Fritz smiled, still pleased with himself. We'll figure it out, Goethe. Now come on, we've got work to do. Chapter 23 
As slow as it was to dig out the rock in the tunnel, at least we had been making progress there. The next few days were spent almost entirely in the garden, working hard for no other purpose than as a cover for what we were actually doing, or should have been doing. I didn't mind the idea of gardening, but the weeds were thick and sometimes thorny, and by the third day it was hard to care about the dirt out here when I really wanted to be down in the tunnel working. After an entire afternoon of pointless, sweaty labor, I didn't think the weeds looked any better than when we had first began. When the heat of the day hit us, Fritz and I decided to sneak inside the building to get back to our real work. As before, he went into the tunnel while I removed dirt with the bucket. But the small basement room was already piling high with dirt, and that bothered me. We had a long way to go before we reached, before we reached the west. What if we ran out of places to store the dirt? Something needed to be done with it. I briefly toyed with the idea of returning to the weeding. At least the weeds didn't require me to think so much. Then I smiled as a wonderful idea came to my mind. If it worked, it would solve both my problems. Rather than dump the bucket outside in the <laughs> rather than dump out the bucket inside the basement, I opened the boarded window and dumped it there. It made a much smaller pile than I expected, so I refilled the bucket from the dirt already in the basement and dumped it outside too. After five or six loads of dirt, I climbed outside and then used the small hand rake from the state to spread the dirt around. It went down smooth and dark and covered up every single weed beneath it. I didn't need to pull weeds. I could cover them up. Sure, our vegetable seeds wouldn't grow very well once they hit the hard ground a few centimeters down, but I didn't care about that. I didn't plan to be here that long. With renewed energy, I began emptying dirt from the basement. The routine was the same, to dump several loads at once and then spread it out. I did it slowly and tried to make it look as if I was pulling weeds rather than covering them. The watchtower was far enough away that unless the guards looked carefully, there wouldn't be any reason to investigate further. Or at least I hoped not. I was always listening for the approaching sounds of one of their vehicles. After a while, Fritz called up to ask what I was doing, and when I invited him up to see it for himself, he only chuckled and brushed his hand across my head. Trust you to do so much hard work to get out of other work, he said, but don't go so fast. If someone is looking for progress... They'll never believe we got all that weeded in a day. He was right, and I returned to carrying dirt back up the ladder. Over and over. That was my routine. Climb down to the air raid shelter. Scoop dirt into the bucket. Hook it over my arm. Climb up the ladder. Dump it out. Repeat. Again and again and again. Rest a little, and then start all over. I'd lost track days ago of how many times I'd made the climb. I could do this now in my sleep. Who knows? I was so tired. Maybe I did. I usually took my rests in the shelter while I watched Fritz's progress. He was nearly five meters into the tunnel and kept track of how straight it was with some boards he had nailed together perpendicular to each other. If one end was always kept straight with the shelter's entrance... The other end should point like an arrow in the direction he should dig. One late afternoon, Fritz said he would lift the book. <laughs> One late afternoon, Fritz said he would lift the buckets for me if I would go and find water to refill his canteen. It required a short walk back to the main part of the city, but I was eager for a change of routine. I stripped off my overalls and stopped by the pond to wash my face and hands. If I was going to convince a restaurant to give me water, I needed to be presentable enough to walk inside. Then I set off toward a, near, a nearby sausage shop where my family used to eat. <coughs> Jeffrey, come on. Leave her alone. <coughs> when I was almost to the restaurant, my eye roamed across the street to a building that had been bombed during the war and still hadn't been repaired. Attempts had been made to clear it some years ago, 
I could tell that because of some rusty old machinery and other pieces of equipment left on the site. There was even a long rope with a pulley attached so that the heavier items could be lifted onto trucks. A pulley! My mind began racing as I pictured that very item in the basement of the welcome building. With a pulley, there would be no more climbing up and down the ladder. Fritz could fill the dirt below, and I could pull it up with a rope and then empty it in the basement. We could work, twi tw we could work twice as fast with half the effort. I needed that pulley. Goethe, what are you doing here? I swerved around and saw that Anna had come up behind me. Her mother was already seated inside the restaurant where I intended to get water, though I hadn't noticed either of them before now. It shouldn't have surprised me to see her to see them here. This was their neighborhood, after all. But of course, she would be surprised to see me, and looking as dirty as I'm sure I did. I stepped back and forced a smile on my face. Fritz and I are gardening, like I told you about earlier. I just came to refill our canteens. Let me get it for you, she said, then wrinkled up her nose. No offense, but you smell like you're up to your eyeballs in gardening. That was true enough, in a way. I handed her our canteens, and she took them inside while I waited, trying as hard as I could not to look at the pulley on the other side of the street. It was only attached by another thick rope. With a good knife, I could cut it free. But when? Certainly not on a day as busy as this one. The problem was that in this neighborhood, every day was busy. It was only at night, after curfew, when everything went quiet. After a few minutes, Anna emerged with full canteens of water, so I... Uh, Anna emerged with full canteens of water so cold, I could feel it through the metal. I wanted to gulp down an entire one right then. Thank you, I said rather awkwardly. She called out, uh, you're welcome, as I walked away, which thoroughly confused me. Were we friends again? Why? Nothing had changed, unless it had changed on her end. Maybe the Stasi had decided to leave her family alone, and she felt safe to be, with, to be friends with me again. I didn't know if I was ready for that. After all, she had treated me horribly over the last couple of months. And I had much bigger things on my mind than anyone's friendship. Which included a need to get into her apartment, I reminded myself. For the sake of the tunnel, I would have to make things good between us. And soon. But in the meantime, I had a pulley to steal. I'll do a couple more chapters later on.